Now we can describe secondary worlds at three different levels or our interactions within secondary worlds in terms of the narratives that we generate. There's the naive level, which is essentially the level at which we would um, see a narrative unfold describing um, a character moving through a world, um, visiting a town, visiting a castle, visiting a spaceship, um, the basic descriptions and everyday actions that occur within a narrative set within a secondary world. And this is often used to describe the locations and the peoples um, and the various mundane aspects, what we call naive elements of a secondary world. Then we have what is called the epic level. This is where um, characters often take on the form of the hero um, and the hero narrative, where there's some sort of challenge that has to be overcome or some sort of um, a villain that has to be defeated um, or a mystery to be solved. But there's some sort of heroic action, something that's notable and worth having a story about. So at the naive level, it's a lot of the mundane stuff, but there's not things that you would generally write a story about. Um, you might include things like that in a travel diary, but they wouldn't be something that you would write as a novel. At the epic level, that's the sorts of things that you would write into a story, um, recording some major conflict or challenges or um, relationships that develop about uh, between various groups or people. And then beyond that, we have a third level, which is called the philosophic level. This is where the narrative gets, gives us a greater understanding of ourselves and of the world that we're interacting with. So it may, might have to do with the political uh, philosophies occurring at the time. It might be the religious perspectives and um, an understanding of religion and the hierarchy of uh, religious elements within a secondary world. It might be an understanding of the politics um, or the, the differences of how different races approach different concepts. Um, so it's really getting into the deep underlying concepts that can be expressed through storytelling, but are not normally directly explained. They're things that you would normally get gain an understanding of as you read several stories set within a secondary world, mythical world type environment. Uh, but they can give us our deepest appreciation and also make the secondary world feel more real because it provides such depth to our understanding of this secondary world. So computer games allow us to go beyond the narrative that we would see in most um, literature and movies and TV shows and comic books that generate secondary worlds. What's special about a computer game is that we have a lot more agency in how that narrative develops. We can change the narrative. Now, as you are doing with your um, choose your own adventure computer game, where the player can choose various narrative arcs and follow those, that's what computer games in general allow. So you're not bound by the one perspective of the author. You can decide to go to a different location or you can decide to ask different questions of different um, people within the game environment rather than just doing a predetermined series of narrative steps. So this freedom to explore the secondary world established in a computer game provides a greater depth of secondary world engagement and helps achieve that suspension of disbelief. Of course, we now have the option to actually have control over what occurs in that secondary world. Now, some games do this better than others. A lot of games still follow through a very traditional arc, uh, narrative arc, and you've got only a small degree of freedom within that. You can fight monsters differently. You can um, make some minor choices of how you progress along different pathways, but essentially you're following one narrative process from the beginning of the game to the end of the game. Not all games though are like that. Um, and we do have in particular the Sandpit games, uh, Minecraft is a good example, where 
It relies upon the player making choices and coming up with their own narratives within that space. They may decide to build a castle or a village and engage with um, characters and um, animals that they encounter in a very freeform way, much less so than um, very highly directed stories. Multiplayer games, though, also tend to be fairly open um, in this respect because the players can decide to do things differently. They might form a guild or a team and approach solving problems in that way. They might be competitive against one another or they might be very cooperative. So all of these different approaches can help build out the complexities of a secondary world. And they can start building those epic narratives where the players are trying to achieve some grand adventure and have to work together to defeat the boss character or to make it to the end of the game or survive the situation they're placed in. And as part of that, they can also sometimes build in the philosophical level, although that's much less um, achieved by most computer games. Uh, it's often in the background that the players have very little opportunity to interact with that. Conversely, role-playing games, um, which are done traditionally with pencil and paper and dice and so forth, have been very good at allowing player contribution, where the game master in particular has had a special role in generating the secondary world that the players interact with. Now, sometimes that's at the naive level. They might decide to generate a dungeon that the players have to move through and decide when they'll encounter monsters and find treasure and things of that nature. But it can also be at a higher level where the players are attempting to achieve some really complex um, heroic actions, saving a town, rescuing a princess, um, overcoming an evil emperor. These sorts of what are called campaigns in a role playing environment provide those epic storytelling narratives that could be then told as we would tell normal um, storytelling narratives. And beyond that, some of these games also allow the players, or the, particularly the game master, to um, establish the religion that would occur within the games, or conflicts between religions, conflicts between gods, um, conflicts between nations. Um, all of these sort of higher level issues often don't directly impact upon the players um, as they play the game, but they have a strong influence um, so the players might decide to do a quest within a particular country. But within that country, there are certain rules and politics and kingdoms and so forth that will influence how they actually go about doing their quest. Now, the quest is the main narrative arc, but the fact that they then oppose the king might then result in the king sending forth an army to defeat them. So those sort of larger scale philosophical issues also can relate to the character development, such as an understanding of good versus evil. As the players complete their quest, are they challenged to do so in a way that is considered good, or might they fall into doing things that would be considered evil? And how do they struggle with those choices? Um, taking the easy path to achieve um, easy victory, or taking the more difficult path that helps um, long-term benefits and helps others other than just themselves. And these moral and philosophical issues can be explored within games. Now computer games generally allow us to do very um, effective naive level and heroic level actions, but they're much less um, amenable for the philosophical levels. There's been a few attempts to achieve that and some of the massive multiplayer online games um, where players form guilds and, and nations can start developing some of these aspects. But in the main, um, they are what is established by the game developers. They establish the, uh, the big picture sort of philosophical level aspects of a game. But there have been a few games that have attempted to uh, break that mold and allow players to uh, develop those aspects of the secondary worlds in which these games are set. So think about how you might use secondary worlds um, 
in terms of how you might learn from playing these secondary worlds and also how you might use them in an educational way. And we'll discuss these in the tutorial.